today we present to you part one of Reason and Wisdom, selections from On Thoughts and Aphorisms by the Mother Vegetarian, as we continue our inner journey of self-realization. Mira Alfasa, who became known as the Mother or Shrima, was born in 1878 in Paris, France. Although she showed great artistic, musical, and writing talent at an early age, her real interest was the spiritual side of life. Based on her inner experience and guidance by a saint she later recognized as Sri Aurobindo, she traveled to India in 1914, where she met him for the first time. As soon as I saw Sri Aurobindo, I recognized in him the well-known being whom I used to call Krishna. And this is enough to explain why I am fully convinced that my place and my work are near him in India. Sri Aurobindo conferred the title of the Mother in recognition of her embodiment of the principles of the Divine Mother. When the decision was made to create an ashram in 1926, Sri Aurobindo entrusted all the spiritual and material tasks of running the ashram to the Mother. For the next 50 years, under her loving guidance, the ashram developed into a spiritual center for truth seekers. The mother went on to found two more organizations, the Sri Aurobindo International Center of Education, offering courses from kindergarten through university level, and a visionary community called Auroville, or the City of Dawn. The mother also developed an extensive series of spiritual writings. These highlight a goal of ultimate union with the Divine along with becoming master of ourselves and our destiny. Shining through all of her work is the mother's love and devotion to God. Though she left her body in 1973, the 17 volumes of collected works of the mother forever serve as a shining guidance and inspiration for spiritual seekers. The following passages come from the mother's book on thoughts and aphorisms where she expounds on the following quote by Sri Aurobindo. What men call knowledge is the reasoned acceptance of false appearances. Wisdom looks behind the veil and sees. Reason divides, fixes details and contrasts them. Wisdom unifies, marries contrasts in a single harmony. All that Sri Aurobindo writes about, knowledge, reason, and wisdom, is said in order to bring us out of the rut of conventional thinking, and if possible, make us perceive the reality behind the appearances. As a general rule, with a few very rare exceptions, men are content to observe more or less accurately everything that happens around them, and sometimes within themselves, and to classify all those observations according to one superficial system of logic or another, and they call this organization, these systems, knowledge. It has never occurred to them, they have not even begun to perceive all the things they see, touch, feel, and experience are false appearances and not reality itself. The constant general argument is, but I see it, I touch it, I feel it, consequently it is true. They should on the contrary tell themselves, I see it, I touch it, I feel it, consequently it is false. We are at opposite poles and there is no way of coming to an understanding. For Sri Aurobindo, true knowledge is precisely knowledge by identity and wisdom is the state one achieves when one is in this true knowledge. He says it here, Wisdom looks behind the veil of false appearances and sees the reality behind it. And Sri Aurobindo emphasizes that when one defines something with the superficial outer knowledge, it is always in opposition to something else. 
it is always by means of a contrast that one explains what one sees, feels, touches, and does not understand. Reason always sets one thing against another and compels you to make a choice. People whose thoughts and reasons are clear see all the differences between the things. It is rather remarkable that reason can only work through differences. It is because one perceives the difference between this and that, one act and another, one object and another, that one makes decisions that reason works. But it is precisely true knowledge, knowledge by identity, and the wisdom which results from it that always sees the point where all apparently contradictory things harmonize, complement each other, form a perfectly coherent, coordinated whole. And naturally that changes the point of view, the perception, and the consequences in action entirely. The first absolutely indispensable step is not to repeat more or less mechanically and without quite knowing what you are saying that appearances are false. You say it because Sri Aurobindo has told us so, but without really understanding it. And yet, when you want to understand something, you continue to look, to observe, to touch, to taste, and to feel, because you believe there are no other means of observation. It is only when you have had the experience of the reversal of consciousness, when you have gone behind these things, when you can feel experience in the most concrete manner, their illusionary appearance that you are able to understand. But unless you have had the experience, you can read all the aphorisms, repeat and learn them, have faith in them, and still not perceive. They have no reality for you. All these appearances remain the only way of coming into contact with the outer world and of becoming aware of what it is. And sometimes you can spend a whole lifetime learning how things are in their appearances and be considered very cultured, very intelligent, highly knowledgeable when you have observed all this in detail and remembered all that you have observed or learnt. Strictly speaking, you can, when you have worked hard, have some slight effect on these appearances, change them a little. This is how, through science, you learn to manipulate matter, but there is no true change and there is no true power. And when you are in that state, you are wholly convinced that there is nothing you can do to change your character. You feel trapped in a kind of fatalism that weighs you down. You know neither whence nor how, you are born like this, in such and such a place, into such and such an environment, with such and such a character, and you get through life as best you can, adapting to things without having much influence on them, and trying to mitigate the drawbacks of your own character without having the power to transform it. You feel caught in a net. You are the slave of something of which you are unaware, you are the plaything of circumstances, of unknown forces, of a will you do not submit to, but which constrains you. Even the most rebellious are slaves because the only thing that liberates you is precisely the act of passing behind the veil and discovering what lies beyond it. Once you have seen, you know who you are, and once you have established your true identity, you have the key to the true transformation. We read, we try to understand, we explain, we try to know, but a single minute of true experience teaches us more than millions of words and hundreds of explanations. So the first question is, how to have the experience? To go within yourself, that is the first step. And then, once you have succeeded in going within yourself deeply enough to feel the reality of that which is within, to widen yourself progressively, systematically, to become as vast as the universe and lose the sense of limitation. These are the first two preparatory movements. And these two things must be done in the greatest possible calm, peace and tranquility. This peace, this tranquility, brings about silence in the mind and stillness in the vital. This effort, 
this attempt must be renewed very regularly, persistently, and after a certain lapse of time, which may be longer or shorter, you begin to perceive a reality that is different from the reality perceived in the ordinary external consciousness. Naturally, by the action of grace, the veil may suddenly be rent from within, and at once you can enter the true truth. But even when that happens, in order to obtain the full value and full effect of the experience, you must maintain yourself in a state of inner receptivity, and to do that, it is indispensable for you to go within each day. For more information about the Mother and Sri Aurobindo, please visit sriaurobindoashram.org. Plant-based nutrition totally works for strength athletes too, for building muscle. This is because plant-based food is alkaline forming. And when you eat alkaline foods, it reduces inflammation. And if you reduce inflammation, you increase functionality. And more functional muscles have the ability to lift heavier weight. Lifting heavier weight is what builds bigger, stronger muscles. Brendan Brazier, Vegan. Charitable viewers, we thank you for your kind presence on today's episode of Words of Wisdom. 